Hello everyone, um, welcome back to Engineering Ethics. Today we're gonna talk about John Rawls's theory, Justice as Fairness. It is um, been extremely influential. John Rawls is probably the most famous, um, most important philosophers of the 20th century. Um, and he combines um, Kantian ethics, so a deontological approach with a social contract approach. This is going to be important for us because it helps us think through um, what fair social policy would look like uh, when we're talking about, I don't know, building a bridge or where to put a garbage dump or, or um, various engineering projects, how those decisions, policy decisions, um, are those just or fair? Okay. Um, and then here, let's define social contract theory, uh, moral or social laws that are made by um, an agreement between rational. This sort of a reasoning approach to see if our, our laws, our policies, our building plans, our plans to put a toxic waste dump in a certain neighborhood, um, if those are actually fair or just. So it's a kind of, um, he sets out a moral reasoning plan. Okay. So um, there are two separate steps in Rawls' theory of justice. So first, he sets out a decision procedure. He gives us a way to reason through what would produce a fair result. Okay. So first he says, let me tell you, this is the decision procedure. This is how we're going to get fair rules. So that's his first step. His second step is, then he tells us, and this is what the rules, the fair rules would be that are generated by, by my decision procedure. I want to point out that you could agree or disagree with either one, with both. You can disagree with both, disagree with one. So first, let's talk about the decision procedure. So how, um, what are the steps that Rawls has set out that will help us come up with fair policy? Rawls says he, he creates this thought experiment, which is just sort of like a fantasy um, scenario that's not literal. Okay. He says we need to go behind what he calls the veil of ignorance. So this is, um, you know, this is like, it doesn't look like a veil. It looks like a wall of ignorance. So you go behind this wall or this veil into the, something called the original position. And in the original position, all that remains of you is that you're rational and self-interested. Rational, self-interested soul sitting up in heaven. And you don't even know, you don't know what earth is about. Okay, but you know you're going to be thrown down there somewhere but you don't know where you're going to end up. You don't know whether you're going to be a woman. You don't know whether you're going to be a man. You don't know if you're going to be a person of color. You don't know if you're going to be, this person looks like they're blind, super rich, um, handicapped, um, orphaned, mentally ill. Um, you don't know anything about yourself. You don't know where you're going to end, where you're going to be born. Oh, and you don't even know really what your values are going to be. So you don't know um, when you come into the world whether you're going to be a devout Muslim, if you're going to be an atheist, if you're going to enjoy running or surfing or working really hard. Um, you don't know if you're going to have artistic talents or athletic talents. I could go on and on. You don't know anything about yourself. You don't even know... You, if you are into like gambling or, or risk taking, all you are is this rational, self-interested being. And you're like, okay, now from this position, what sort of rules would I create for the world I'm about to be born into? So Rawls thinks that um, behind the veil of ignorance, this is where this is how we would make just laws. Okay, so this is a quote from him. If a knowledge of particulars is allowed, so knowledge of all the particulars of myself, then the outcome is biased by arbitrary contingencies. If the original position, that's the position behind the veil of ignorance, is to yield agreements that are just, 
the parties must be fairly situated and treated equally as moral persons. Um, the arbitrariness of, and the reading does a really good job of talking about what that means to be um, fairly situated and treated equally before you enter a contract and how um, he uses the example in The Godfather. Um, you enter a contract with Don Corleone. Um, you know, he says he, he made you an offer he couldn't refuse, right? Um, it's not, you're not, um, where is it? We're not fairly situated, me and the godfather, um, and we're not treated equally because the godfather has so much more power and the offer that I can't refuse is maybe if you don't do it, I'm going to kill you, right? So that's not any agreement I enter into with Don Corleone from the godfather is going to be um, unjust because um, it's a coerced sort of contract. And the reading does a great job of talking about um, different um, entering into contracts and how, um, if you're interested, if, and how that um, may be just or unjust. The arbitrariness of the world must be corrected for by adjusting the circumstances of the initial um, contract situation. So Rawls is just explaining that in order to make sure that, that when we make this agreement about the, the contract that we enter into is fair, so the contract, what rules would rational self-interested people agree to if they didn't know where they would end up in the world? Okay, so that's the first part. That's the way we decide. Okay, so Rawl says that we would use something called, that he calls maximin reasoning when we're behind the veil of ignorance. So maximum reasoning is this, uh, just the way the word sounds, you maximize the minimum. So rational people would make sure that the worst place they could possibly end up wouldn't be too bad. So you're gonna maximize the worst case scenario. So when you um, think about throwing yourself, you're about to be launched into this world, you don't know where you're gonna be, you think, what social policy should we have for the mentally disabled? So I'm thrown into this world and I end up, um, what policy would you implement for mental illness? You wouldn't, if you're behind the veil of ignorance, be like, oh yeah, let's have a policy of slavery. Um, we'll have these um, um, this group of this group of people do all the work, and the rest of the people will sit around and have so much fun, right? But you wouldn't implement that law because um, you don't know if you will end up being a slave. Um, you don't know if you're going to end up being homeless, so you wouldn't want a policy like where there's a policy that lets people go around executing homeless people. You wouldn't have that policy because you don't know if you would end up being homeless. You wouldn't have a policy that you can't wear headscarves. You might be in uh, that religious minority that considers it important to wear a headscarf. Behind the veil of ignorance, if you're using maximum reasoning, you are not going to accept a utilitarian um, policy. And this is important, uh, this contrast here between maximum reasoning and utilitarianism, because a lot of the cost benefit analyses um, used in public policy in sort of um, engineering policy relies on utilitarian criteria and not maximum. So it ends up, so utilitarian, so why would rational people reject utilitarianism? Well, utilitarianism cares about creating the greatest balance, the best, the most optimistic balance of happiness to misery in the world. By sacrificing a minority, you could potentially create greater overall happiness. Okay, suppose that um, in the state of California, California allows the processing of certain toxic chemicals. And by doing so, 
uh, they're able to bring in all this income, um, create all these jobs, um, raise the minimum wage for everybody. So everybody's getting seventeen fifty. Let's just say seventeen fifty an hour in California. Um, because this industry, just um, where these chemicals are produced, is so prosperous. But um, the side effect is that the fumes um, from these chemicals leach out and give, um, let's say, one in 10,000 children die from brain cancer. One in 10,000. All right, a utilitarian would say, but they would say, yeah, that's a good trade-off, right? Um, only a few children die of brain cancer, but overall, um, s s the, the balance of happiness to misery um, is, is really good. I mean, think of all those people making enough money to live and... Um, the prosperity that comes to the state of California because of this. But the price is um, being a child that dies of brain, brain cancer. A person behind the veil of ignorance would not agree to this because you do not know if you will be that kid. So by using maximum reasoning, this is these are the two principles of justice that Rawls says that rational, disinterested people behind the veil of ignorance would agree to. People would never um, trade away their freedoms, freedom of speech, religion, um, sense of like equality in the eyes of the law, uh, participation as equal citizens in government. You would not sell those things away. So it's like sort of basic uh, liberties um, and freedoms, um, freedom to pursue um, your idea of the good. Um, those are all, those are things that um, all rational disinterested people would agree to. All right. And then the second thing that Rawl says people would agree to is this, something called uh, the difference principle. It's this, social and economic inequalities in society are permitted if everyone is better off because of that. Social inequalities are like in social status <clears throat> and economic inequalities are, you know, some people make a ton of money and other people uh, make far less. Um, would agree to this <clears throat> because of this clause one, everyone is better off because of those inequalities. So let me give you a thought experiment. <clears throat> so this, this um, demonstrates why inequality in society could be um, rational. Okay, so suppose I tell you that I have two envelopes. The first envelope here has five, $5 bills in it, and there's one for everyone in the class. All right, this second envelope has one $100 bill and the rest $10 bills. So the first system here, so these represent social systems. This is a social system of pure equality. Everybody gets the same thing. It's equal, it's fair, okay? The second one has one $100 bill and the rest $10 bills. Now this is unequal. And um, actually Rawls would say it would, it would only be unfair if uh, people didn't choose it or institute, if didn't choose this sort of social system. So whoever gets the $100 bill, it's just random. Okay, but which one? Now you don't know, you're behind the veil of ignorance, so to speak, because I'm holding these envelopes and you don't know who's gonna get that 100 because I'm just gonna pass them out randomly. Would you choose the first envelope with all fives in it or the second envelope with one $100 bill and the rest $10 bills, okay? Obviously, right, you're, you're thinking maximin, right? So here, 
the the worst case worst case scenario is you get five dollars here the worst case scenario is you get ten dollars so if you're choosing between two economic systems or social systems or social policies this unequal policy um makes the people who are worse off better off right so the worst you can do in this society is ten dollars so that is preferable even though it's unequal to this one okay so it's similar in um inequalities are permitted according to Rawls a rational people behind the veil of ignorance would choose an unequal system if that system made everyone better off okay so